All right. I was originally going to try to stuff it all into a single video, but to do the topic justice, I've decided to split the discussion up a bit. To clearly illustrate the points of a discussion on roguelike deck builders, deck building roguelikes, or whatever you want to call them, we first need to cover a bit of the history of cards, including the timeline of collectible card games BS. For those of you primarily here for the roguelike part, or specifically interested in the combination of deck builders with roguelikes, don't worry, we're going to give each the same treatment. Buckle in, these will be proper lectures. Far into the past, back in the days of the 19th century, the trade cards, essentially miniature adverts, that had existed for hundreds of years as a way to bring customers into businesses, evolved into a slightly different way to increase profit. At first, it was simply firm pieces of paper being included in cigarette packaging to stiffen the packs and protect the products from damage, but this almost immediately became firm pieces of paper with adverts on them. As people began collecting these different adverts, companies quickly realized they could increase sales a bit by having special sets that could only be collected by buying a larger volume of packages than a customer usually would, often with each only being available for a limited period of time. In addition to the more traditionally popular imagery such as flags or animals, these would frequently be popular culture references of the late 1800s, including boxers, actresses, or baseball players. The reason I start with tobacco cards rather than baseball or sports cards is simple. Those cards were trying to drum up interest in the sport or team featured, whereas cigarette cards either earned money for the tobacco company by essentially selling advertisement space, or by getting people who wanted to collect a whole set of whatever to buy more cigarettes. Keep in mind, this is during a time when cigarettes were largely dwarfed by cigar and pipe smoking and were trying to gain popularity. But I digress. The key point is that they were an attempt to profit via the production of a cheaply reproduced asset given value by rarity and acquired largely by chance or volume of purchase. As the sport of baseball matured, and especially with the advent of radio and television bringing sports into the living room of the average American, the Topps Chewing Gum Company took a cue from cigarette cards that had been discontinued during World War II due to wartime supply and production problems and launched a very similar system with their bubblegum trading cards at the start of the 1950s. The key significance of this notation is that they found success with largely the same principle. Create sets that are limited production, individual cards being acquired at random or via volume of purchase, and given value by rarity. We can now proceed to ignore sports cards despite their continuation to the modern era in one form or another because we don't care about sports ball now, do we? The correct answer is no, we're nerds. So, the next part of the timeline that we care about is this. In the 90s, a lot of companies were noticing people kind of liked collecting things that had the illusion of value much higher than their cost of production. This took many forms such as the Beanie Baby, the Pog, and the collectible card game. Also known as a trading card game, collectible card games worked on a familiar formula. Take a cheap piece of paper, put some cheap ink on it, but limit the number available of each individual image and force people to either get lucky or buy large volumes of randomized packs of cards to get the whole set or just the ones they wanted. Then, simply increase the perceived value of the pieces of paper by creating an entire game to be played based on which images and words were on these pieces of paper. Now, in addition to perhaps wanting a particular card or the full set, people needed particular cards from the set to play the game optimally. Sure, the casuals and children would settle for whatever animal they got, whether it was a 1-1 first strike tundra wolf or a 1-1 banding timber wolf. Some would even prefer the lowly 2-2 grizzly bears, even though the wolves were better. Yeah, sis, you're still and will always be wrong about that. The child, though, wasn't the actual target audience of the collectible card game. The targets of these companies had jobs. You can clearly tell by the art and theming of the early Magic the Gathering cards that this game was targeted at a more mature audience. With its success, though, many other collectible card games came in the mid to late 90s. Star Wars, Battletech, Pokemon, Dune, Shadowrun, Legend of the Five Rings, Star Trek, Yu-Gi-Oh! Even SimCity had a card game to try to get that sweet, sweet money from irresponsible workers who hadn't quite developed full adult responsibilities like mortgages or families.
This situation was only made worse by the resale of individual cards and an entire market cropping up around them. There were even magazines that primarily served as a stock market ticker for these pieces of paper, where the prices would literally be changed with each month's issue. I'm just going to cut this rant off now because we're here for facts, and I can't comment on the rest of the situation without corrupting it with emotion. But let's be real. Anyone who remembers seeing a first edition, mint condition Black Lotus in a game shop's case for less than $20, then scoffed at paying almost $20 for a piece of paper, will be unable to address 90s card shops objectively. The key takeaway was that the entire concept of a CCG was a pay-to-win loot box fiesta from day one. Beyond this, the cards managed to become a sort of commodity, prompting investment in these things as if they were a stock or gold, even by people who didn't play the game. Worse, it was more approachable to the average person who often didn't understand risk analysis, but that's an entirely separate lecture that I'm not qualified to cover. Even so, I feel it is a noteworthy problem with some relevance to the discussion. So, let's finally get to the game design part of this history. There were three distinct aspects that generated the game part of any of these collectible card games, and all three aspects were the same, even if the specifics of each aspect were a bit different from one system to another. First came the collecting of the cards for your deck. Then came the building of your deck. Then came the playing of the game with your deck. Different players enjoyed each of these aspects to differing degrees, including some, like myself, who didn't enjoy playing the games nearly as much as the collecting and deck construction theory crafting. So, finally, we get to the part where we can break free of all the loot box shenanigans and crazy amounts of money being thrown around for pieces of paper as we proceed into 2008. Donald X. Vaccarino, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, looked at the formula and made two simple shifts that led to a dramatically simplified gameplay loop we now know as the basis of the deck building genre. The most important change from CCGs is the inclusion of all the cards in the base game purchase, which, as a result, gives all players equal access to the entire set rather than just whatever they got via luck or spending. The only other change relevant to the lesson is the inclusion of the card acquisition and deck construction in the actions of the game itself, rather than outside the game and before the players start officially playing. This may have been inspired, in part, by the draft-style tournaments of CCGs, where players would arrive at a shop or event, pay to participate in the tournament, and then fresh card packs would be opened and decks would be constructed at the onset of the tournament. However, even in these tournaments, the building of the deck was prior to play beginning. So, let's discuss, in a vague and somewhat quick analysis, what these changes to the formula opened the door for and allowed to develop in the deck building genre. Naturally, specific deck building games will differ in how much each of these apply, but let's rattle through the general list. The importance of luck was significantly reduced. This was a result of both eliminating it from impacting the pre-game access to cards entirely, and due to the necessary reduction in starting deck sizes, since building a deck over the course of play requires the initial size of the deck to be small enough that cards can be added without the player's deck becoming excessively large and bloated. The fewer cards available to be drawn, the more consistent the draws over the first rounds of the game will inevitably become. The core strategies of the game, rather than being independent of your opponents, as it often is with CCGs, can actually be adjusted over the course of a game based on the deck you see your opponents building. This breeds counterplay that cannot exist in a traditional CCG gameplay loop, and even in a draft tournament had limited impact since knowing what type of deck one's opponents were building and the cards they were using could not significantly modify the draft deck the player was building. It was almost always better, instead, to be focused around whatever were the most powerful individual or combination of cards the player could get into their deck. In deck builders, the player interactions became more dynamic. In a traditional CCG, there would often be situations where the thing your deck wanted to do were either completely or partially negated by your opponent's deck, or, more often, each deck just wanted to do whatever it wanted to do, and whoever's deck managed to succeed at their win condition first walked away the victor. 
With the deck building formula including the construction and execution of the deck in the same play cycle, it allowed different deck builders to introduce mechanisms that allowed players to actively interfere with or otherwise respond to the very plan their opponent was attempting to execute. This, then, resulted in additional gameplay decisions and actions of shifting focus, misleading your opponents, or otherwise playing a bit of a mind game beyond the physical game to create even further player interaction and depth. It also allowed strategic diversity well beyond that seen in traditional CCGs, despite a simplification of rules and card interactions. This is even beyond the drop of diversity in CCGs that occurred when an overly powerful card or combination of cards were released, especially if the card or cards weren't rare or expensive. Even beyond the edge case of a balance problem manifesting, deck builders always allowed for a variety of different skills and tactics to emerge, including adjustments over the course of an individual match. This led to far more complex strategies than simply building the best deck your collection allowed and executing its preconceived plan every match, or at least trying to. In example, creating a lean, efficient engine out of your deck is a vastly different experience to building a deck stuffed full of power that is a bit more risky or dependent on lucky draws. But it is entirely possible to shift between even these two disparate strategies mid-game in most deck builders. And the final, but arguably most important change that came from the deck builder formula above the CCG formula was the reduction in investment to play, or even try, the game. In order to get a new player to try a CCG, one had to, at minimum, teach them the basic rules and either give or convince them to purchase a deck of cards. Most often, this deck will be objectively weaker than the deck of the CCG player trying to introduce the new player. If they, despite likely having no chance of victory in this first experience, were then interested in the full CCG experience, they would have to commit finances and time into not only learning about and obtaining the cards they needed and the decks they could make, but also the other types of cards and decks that they could potentially run into. It could take countless weeks to start to get a decent understanding, not only of how the game works, but why they were winning or losing the games they played at all. There are many factors beyond the control of the individual CCG player in a given match, their chosen strategy, and their particular deck attempting to execute that strategy for them to consider as they learn the game. In contrast, the deck builder allows the owner of the box to show up to a friend, party, gathering, or whatever, sit down with people who have never heard of the game, and just get started. After little more explanation than most other board games that exist, players can begin their first match of a deck builder and, likely, conclude that game with a much better grasp of what they did well or poorly in their first experience or, at the very least, have some idea of other things to try in their next match that might bring them more success. More importantly, the players of a deck builder have the capacity to attempt these new strategies without needing to spend any additional money to do so. Further, if a group of friends who do not actively play a CCG want to try it, one or each of them need to invest into buying at least one deck per player. Then they, hopefully, have a decent enough combination of cards to have functional, much less good, decks. After all of that, they get to try a limited sample of the full experience available to see if they like the game and are willing to then further invest to potentially develop enough of a collection to start building somewhat competitive decks. Deck builders, in contrast, always start players on equal footing and always have the full experience available from the start. By allowing a new player to gain experience by building on a deck that already functions, it eases the ability to understand the actual effects of their decisions. This all results in a smoother progression of improvement at the game completely devoid of the spikes in success available for purchase in CCGs. Now, while most of these points focus on tabletop multiplayer experiences, many of them are still quite relevant to a single-player experience, whether physical or digital. The specific combination this miniseries is covering, after all, is the roguelike deck builder. So, naturally, the next video will be covering roguelikes. After that, we will finally be ready to discuss how the aspects of deck builders and roguelikes were merged into a compelling formula that found great success and propagated into a full subgenre of card game.
we will not be covering the variety of other tangential topics available, such as dice builders, gotcha games, or roguelike modes being added to digital CCGs. At least not yet. But for now, that concludes my lecture on the deck builder game genre. So, until next time, have a good one.